Hello and welcome to Channel's Book Club. My name is Olakunle Kasumo and it's great to be on the show. Again, this is the show where we talk all things books. If you've not gotten into the world of books, what are you waiting for? Books tell us everything. It's, a, it's an exciting world. Adventures, romance, action, and of course, real life stories. Now, this is a book titled Double Geopardy. Now, if you are looking for characters who have been involved in Nigeria's political history, I mean, recent political history, I mean, the last 40 years thereabout, you are talking about people like this gentleman, Dr. Doin Okupe. Finally, his book is out. I've always been concerned about you know, people like this who were main actors, you know, of our politics over the years, not telling their stories, not writing their stories. But I'm glad that he has written his own story. And if you know this man, then you know you've got to read this book because it is packed. One of the interesting chapters here that I saw is um, um, June 12 from the NRC perspective. I mean, it's amazing. You've got um, formative years, immediate family in the medical theater, uh, Abacha days, first half of presidential journey, the Obasanjo years, psychophancy, and so on. But chapter eight, June 12, from the NRC perspective is really interesting. You know, we, the, the June 12 story has been told from different perspectives, but he, he, he told that story from the NRC. You know, remember, the late MKO was in the S SDP, and then um, the opposing party was the NRC. And he said, the June 12 story should be told from the NRC perspective. And he told that um, in this book. And so many other exciting things in this book. Recently, he launched this book, which is his autobiography. And we were there. Enjoy this report. Dignitaries from various walks of life gathered to honor veteran medical practitioner, entrepreneur, and politician Dr. Doi Okupe as he launches his autobiography titled Double Jeopardy in commemoration of his 70th birthday. The revealing book, which explores the life and times of Dr. Okupe from childhood through eventful sojourns in medicine and politics, is divided into two parts, with 23 chapters in the first part and 17 chapters in the second part. The 296-page book sheds light on some of the most pivotal events in Nigeria's recent political history and many of Okupe's experiences as he served as special assistant to two presidents of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The chairman of the occasion, Governor Shei Makinde of Oyo State, represented by Olubamiwo Adioshun, speaks about the author. The writer of the book today, Dr. Doni Okupe, has lots and loads of experience and it's um it's a responsibility to you know for someone who has so much experience to want to pen it down so that in years to come people will be able to look at the book and say oh so this is his perspective or this is what he said happened here so um i'd like to say first of all congratulations and well done because many people would have wanted to do this and they might not have been able to complete it. Or God might not even have allowed them to complete it because our lives don't belong to us. So I think um, to be able to have a book launch on your 70th birthday, hail and hearty, bringing so many people here today, it's indeed um, something worth saying congratulations to you. So congratulations. The governor of Ogun State, Dakwa Biodun, is represented by the deputy governor of the state, Noimot Salako Oyedele. And I'm sure that there is a lot that we will all be able to learn from what we have in Doppi Jeopardy. And uh, we expect that uh, all this uh, experience which you would have put down there for all of us will guide us through as we continue to work on Project Nigeria and uh, take it to a better place. 
I know the future leaders of this country would also have a lot to learn from him. Gentlemen, let's make welcome a friend of the nation. The reviewer of the book gives snippets of what readers should expect from the book. The first jeopardy, he was not happy about the circumstances of his exit from that administration. He felt very hard because he didn't expect it. He wasn't looking forward to it. And it, he thought that it was uh, a lot of intrigue uh, that surrounded that. And when uh, Baba Obasanjo gave signal that he was going to uh, turn him adrift, uh, he was truly shocked because he had invested time and effort in giving his best to promoting that particular administration. The second time, the 2015 general elections, which the, uh, the Jonathan administration uh, lost. As at the time the government was living, uh, he in fact uh, had no money. Contrary to popular you know, belief and expectations, and this was the second uh, geopardy. The author speaks from his book and advises politicians to read and learn from it. The book is, is like a compendium of uh, really what my life has been all about. My, my birth, my upbringing, my politics, my family, and uh, what hopes I have for, for, for Nigeria, what, what can be done to uh, ameliorate the situations which we are in in the country presently. It's good for our politicians to, uh, to actually read and to actually read about events, events of the past. You know, because also the past has a peculiar way of guiding and affecting the future, especially in politics. Especially in politics, it does. And if only, you know, we could learn from the mistakes of others, you will find out that, you know, a lot, a lot of mistakes that uh, governments, you know, in succession do make, they can avoid them. Other dignitaries present at the occasion also speak about the author. I'm a doctor Daniel Kupwe, medical doctor, town politician, has given a very good account of himself over the years. Uh, somebody who has a very strong character, a good mind despite his big frame, and somebody with whom I've enjoyed um, a very special relationship, despite the fact that we contested against each other in the past. I'm very happy for him. I'm excited, and that's why I've come here to support him. I think we need people like that in the service of our country. He's a man with passion, a man who, when he believes in a cause, we threw everything in him into that course. He was part of the formation of Nadeko. He participated fully. On principle, he resigned as public secretary of the NRC because of June 12. When we formed AD, he was part of it, although he ended up a PDP, but he's a man I respect a lot. Now that's a book you should read and there are so many other books written by Nigerians with various experiences in various fields but there are still a lot of more stories that have not been written that have not been told if you are out there and you owe us a story get on with it get that story out we need it we need so many more of these kinds of stories now up next, Nigeria has hundreds of ethnic groups. I don't like to call them tribes. I mean, we're talking about people who are up to 40 million, 30 million, 35 million, 20 million, 10 million, and somebody says they are tribes. No way, they are ethnic groups. Well, it, maybe it's a matter of semantics, but um, the anthropologists and the sociologists will be able to explain that to us better. But I like to say we have hundreds of ethnic groups and some of those ethnic groups, many of those ethnic groups have histories that date back to thousands of years, hundreds of years, but nobody is telling all those stories. Maybe that's a slight exaggeration. Not many people are telling those stories. Now, a fascinating gentleman has made an attempt at telling the story of the great Ibibio people of Nigeria, and he's put this story in this fascinating book.
The book was recently launched and we were there. Enjoy this. As part of efforts to preserve the history and culture of his people, Otobong Uwa conceived and finally launches his book titled Ibibio Nation, People and Culture. Uwa is from Ibibio, a town of Fort community in Uyo local government area of Akwaibom State. He is a first degree holder of accounting from the University of Uyo and holds a Master of Science degree in International Accounting and Finance from the University of Liverpool. His career has spanned 19 years as an accountant and budget cost analyst in the public and private sector. In 2015, his quest to document a written work about his ethnic origin created the pathway to a more expansive research that evolved to produce the launch of his new book. I hereby unfurl this book. The book explores the historical facts and values of the culture and the people of Ibibio. There's no gain saying that to properly preserve history, Africans must go beyond the oral to the written. This was one of the ideas that inspired Uwa to write his new book. The author gives antiquity and sociological aspects of the Ibibio people based on his perception. Speaking on the importance of the book on the culture of the people of Ibibio, the keynote speaker Udom Inyoyo describes the author as a hero. I believe this book will add to the literature on the Bibios. As we rejoice with you, please, I'm begging, let us not forget the words of Mohammed Hassan. The heroes of the society are those who have the characteristics and qualities that society appreciates widely. People imitate their behaviors and values. I pray our society rises to the challenge of producing the right caliber of heroes and heroines. Representing the former governor of Akwaibom State, Obong Victor Atta, as the chairman of the occasion is Assam Assam, who delivers the ex-governor's message. What Otobong Uwa has done at his age, his station in life, the capacity with which he has brought, the quality of work he has done, the ability to assemble you, even to come and listen to the presentation of it, and the people he has brought here, is a thing that must be commended. Other dignitaries present also bear their minds on the book. I'm amazed at the kind of thing that he has put in the book. I'm amazed at the ease of reading it. I'm thrown over by the extent and the deepness of the research and I am extremely happy to be here. It's important for people to know where they are coming from. And the Ibibio Nation is trying to do that with this book, you know, by the author. And secondly, it is by documenting this book that others will be able to read and understand, you know, the long and historic nature of uh, the different divergent uh, groups that we have in this country. The author speaks on what inspired him to write the book. I started by writing about my community and I got fascinated uh, about the enriched history. I decided to dump that book for a while. It's not permanent, I'll still publish that. But to go deeper and I had a longer three year research on the Bibio Nation and we have the book today. He also speaks on how the book can positively influence the society. To enrich our heritage, enrich the literature around our heritage, it's going to encourage young people to, to delve into culture and heritage studies. I mean, you don't need to be in the academia to do that. And it's going to promote our culture in a different way like, that has never been seen before. And um, it's going to make students to, to have um, materials for research. And it's going to be a, a, a core study of our heritage for the future generations. In the words of Robert Allen, Cultural differences should not separate us from each other, but rather 
cultural diversity brings a collective strength that can benefit all of humanity. With this important work by Otobong Uwa, readers will be able to understand the cultural differences of the Ibibio people, thereby strengthening their collaborations with them to have a better society. Welcome back. One of the most amazing books I've read is this book titled Akachuku. Oh my goodness, this book is really good. Now, the author of this book, I simply like to call him Chooks. He's been on this show before. He watched Roots when he was young. Now, if you remember, Roots was a hit TV show in the 1980s. Roots told the story of Kunta Kente, the story of slave trade. Now, one of the things that we have failed to do in Nigeria is to tell the slave trade story from the Nigerian perspective. Did you know that the slave trade history of Nigeria is really gruesome? Really, really gruesome. Now, the greatest number of slaves taken away from the continent of Africa were, were taken from this place that we now call today Nigeria. Of course, it wasn't called Nigeria hundreds of years ago. Now, the author of Akachuku watched Rhodes when he was young and decided to tell the slave trade story from a Nigerian perspective. And hence came this book titled Akachuku. It's a very thick thick book. You have to be determined to finish it. But the good thing is that it's exciting. So the more you open the pages, the more you want to open the next page and the next page and the next page until you are done with it. But Jokes decided, look, for the sake of those who don't want to read big books, let me turn this into a trilogy of, I mean, small books. So here we are. The big Akachuku, the thick Akachuku is now three in one. Fantastic. Amazing. It's amazing what you can do with an idea. If you write a book, it can be turned into a miniseries, it can be turned into a TV program, it can be turned into a movie, a documentary, and all sorts of things. But Chokes was with us, and he read from that book, or rather this book, titled Akachuku. Enjoy this. Hi there. My name is Chukes Ofege Oenyomu. I'm a writer, an author, and a designer of landscape. I am the author of Aka Chuku, a book that records the saga of an African family that was despised during the slave trade. It tells the story of the Africans in diaspora, as well as those who were left behind in Africa. And today, put this together, so that people will know that in everything, there is the hand of God. That is why it's Akachuku, the hand of God. Today, I'll be reading from chapter number four, which is telling us what was happening in Africa before the slave trade even came. Chapter four. It had been exactly three moons since Onyobia was buried. The day had started bright, dry, and dusty. A thick clay fin covered everything in the open, from rooftops to treetops, giving it a strange alien ambience. The few grassy paths east that still displayed some form of miserable existence were masterly crafted in deep bronze brown pastel, a far cry from their natural, luxurious, vibrant green complexion. Indeed, the dry season had overstayed its welcome. Anxiety-ridden faces looked to the heavens for the slightest hint of rain, but no dice. The heavens were not yielding. As the morning wore on, it became evidently clear that it was going to be yet another stifling, stiff, steamy day. Then all of a sudden, an unsettling calm enveloped the land. For a very brief moment, it was like all stood still. Even the birds held their breath and went quiet. The wind paused in its gentle stride, and the trees complied by standing still. Dark, ominous clouds floated hastily from opposing directions and converged over Ohofia, and the mid-morning sun disappeared from sight. Within the moment, the animals and birds with a keen sixth sense would seek refuge from the brewing storm. The first massive drops of rain started splashing down. 
What a relief. The first drops of rain quickly disappeared to placate the dry patch mother earth. It was when the earth was saturated enough the rain collected into little puddles that trickled into little streams that raised into miniature tributaries and rivers that flooded the land. Orphia's first downpour of the rainy season came down with a fury and lasted all through the morning unto noon. And all of Orphia safely stayed indoors to wait out the storm. And just as it suddenly started, it stopped abruptly. The volatile sun this time shamefacedly kept its distance. The downpour had effectively cleaned up the dust-laden atmosphere and environment, and also tempered the humid heat. As Aka stepped out from his mother's hut, he could smell the crispy clean air and savoured his refreshing vigour as he filled his lungs. He dragged his father's favorite wooden reclining chair from its usual position under the orange tree into the open air. He swiped the hard wooden stems and twine contraption with the hostel, whose primary assignment is to deal with flies. He made himself comfortable and laid back, going into the ocean wide, clear blue sky. A flock of leke leke, migratory white geese, flying their typical V formation, flew directly overhead. He involuntarily scanned his fingernails to see the white streaks that magically come with these mythical birds. His mind wandered to folklore of old that tell of distant lands and the mighty oceans that these mythical migratory birds transverse religiously every year. He envied their freedom and strength. Or is it their destiny of daring adventures? If only they could speak, he would want to hear of the mortals that inhabit these distant lands. He closed his eyes to fully relish this singular moment of solace since the demise of his father. The rains were indeed symbolic. He thought to himself, high time they washed away all the pain and tears for Onyobia. He had spent the entire morning before and during the rain to discuss with his mother, who was scheduled to round up today the stipulated traditional mourning period for her husband. They had broached many subjects, especially that of his marriage, which he had as re as reassured her that something was in the offing. They did not even notice that the rain had stopped until Adora came over to help her friend through the minor ritual of the mourning. She must have all their hair on her body clean shaven and then took her first official bath since she started mourning over her husband. The coarse, dark mourning regalia she had worn were to be burnt to signify that she was now free to return to the normal swing of life. Marry again if she so desired and thereafter she was expected to visit friends and family to appreciate them for their support during the time of despair. And it was their customary visitation she had embarked with her bosom friend that afternoon. The events of the past three months flooded back. The news of Onyobia's demise had spread through off as a wildfire at the end of her maternal season. And just as Agwala had foretold, Onyobia in death received more accolades and respect than in all his lifetime. Orfi had never given such honor and privilege to any man considered to be a mystery stranger. This is where we have to draw curtains on the show today. As always, we'll be very delighted to get your feedback through any of our social media platforms displayed on your screen. We're always happy to hear from you and always delighted to respond to any inquiry that you might have. My name is Ola Kunle Kasumo. Remember, one great book can change your life. Bye-bye.